be in the ground level and then let me come back when it's made and I'm mm-hmm. made and we just like, yo, yeah. I remember that time when we had bare walls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we definitely you doing know? that. I feel like I've already done so much unpacking already. Um, we're listening. Um, but today, thank you guys for tuning in to Unpacking, where we unlearn what's unhealthy. We have our amazing guest, Carlos, here. He is, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about yourself. Gotcha. You do it best. <laughs> How y'all doing? <laughs> thank you. How y'all doing? Um, my name is Carlos J. Malave. I'm a motivational speaker, author, um, restorative justice consultant and CEO and founder of Translating Success LLC. Um, what I do is with restorative practices, I go around schools and I consult schools on how to implement the practices and make it more of a lifestyle from teachers, administrators to students, top to bottom. Um, and then I built a curriculum to that's aligned to ELA teaks and um, standards and has projects and assessments is measurable that can be implemented and then start changing the culture within the school. So people can not just have pay me to come in and teach you and feel good about it. It's like, okay, there's a step and there's something tangible you can take and walk away from. So you can continue to work and start changing lives um, on a daily basis. And it's not only for the students, the teachers will do the work. Uh, one of my lesson plans, once a week, once a month, uh, once whenever, and it'll start, uh, running things in their head like, oh, I need to deal with certain things in my life. Mm-hmm. It'll bring awareness to them. So it's start changing the culture and shifting everything as a whole, mm-hmm. which is the mission with my business. That's a beautiful thing, which means you are perfect for us here today. Um, so basically, I want to start, uh, like you start with the children. Let's start with your childhood. How, yeah. how did you grow up? Um, well, I grew up in uh, predominantly black and brown community in Brooklyn, New York, if you hear the accent, um, mm-hmm. that's where it's coming from. I say my case a little harder, um, <laughs> Brooklyn all day. <laughs> so, um, so I grew up in a black and brown community. Um, my family is from Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. Uh, both my parents were born in Puerto Rico and they moved out. My mom moved out here with her family when she was teenage years. And my dad moved out here when he was an adult already. Um, so, you know, growing up in my community and in my household, um, I saw a bunch of different things. And that's where the translated success comes from. Um, and I talk about it in my book, uh, Translating Success. Um, I grew up in a, a bilingual household where I learned two different words can look totally different, mm-hmm. but mean the same exact thing, mm-hmm. right? And that struck with me, right? And then as I grew up in my household, uh, seeing different experiences, I was never like the big, um, academic in my household. My mom was a teacher for years. She's still teaching, uh, 25 plus years. Um, and my dad was a construction worker, right? And he, you know, rough childhood, grew up on the street, no father, um, a bunch of stuff, trauma that he dealt with. And he, he kind of, I told you earlier, my, my father, um, it reminded me of a lyric that Jay-Z, my favorite, um, artist, um, said in one of his songs, hope did that, so hopefully you won't have to go through that. I used to replace the the, the words in that and say, my pops went through that, so mm-hmm. I wouldn't have to go through that. So he protected me from a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. right? So he was in the street. He mm-hmm. was doing the alcohol. He was doing this. He was uh, messing with the game bangers, and they wouldn't mess with me because they knew who Carlos was. I was I'm junior. Okay. So, um, so I had that, and then my mom came from first generation, like, going to college and then she got all her siblings, all her five siblings to go to college, right? So like, I came from, I seen both sides mm-hmm. of the thing, but like growing up, I was in the academic, my brother and sister were, okay. right? They were like 4.0 and 4.3 students. I'm talking about Valley mm-hmm. Victoria and wearing a white coat mm-hmm. at graduation and getting academic scholarships and stuff. And I was the athlete that can communicate and was popular and knew how to talk, I love talking. Obviously I get paid to talk, so that's what I do. Um, but um, I, I realized that growing up, it always came back to two words can look totally different, but mean the same thing. My success doesn't have to look like everybody else's success, mm-hmm. right? My brother and sister were academic, but what I could do was special too. Mm-hmm. I just had to find value in that and then put it towards what I was going to do in my life. You know what I mean? And as life turned out, like that, that's, that's what needed to be communicated to students, right? Mm-hmm. And to people at a younger age, like, don't worry about what everybody else is good at because mm-hmm. we all trying to fit into boxes that we don't fit into. Right. Right. I wasn't meant for that. 
but I have skills and I have strengths that I need to like hone and be able to own mm -hmm. and be able to master, right? And then I can add here and there, but know what you're really good at, right? And for me, it was being able to have conversations and talk and not be afraid of the limelight and be able mm -hmm. to be outspoken. And, and, and I was big into sports and that helped with my leadership. Like playing basketball, being around people, how to, how to like discipline myself, how to work through tough times and failure. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like for me, I had a lot of failure early and it, it made me stronger. You know what I mean? Did you find yourself lost on the path of trying to figure out how to Absolutely. grow your skills? Absolutely. How did you kind of do that? I think here's the mission too. When you're growing up, we so focused on who's not giving you what you want that we don't see who's actually there. Mm -hmm. Like for me, and this is where everything happened. Like um, my father, he did so good at trying to be, trying to fit what he could fit, right? But he didn't like there were certain things that he couldn't give to me, mm -hmm. right? But he didn't block off other men to enter my life to offer that. Right. So when I met my coaches, he would build these relationships with these coaches and bring them over this and that. And I didn't see the value. I didn't know he was doing that. Mm -hmm. Where I learned, my coaches told me, like, there's parents that they deprive me in the way. Ain't no other man going to be like teaching my kid or kicking games to my kid. My dad allowed that because he knew he was he wasn't perfect mm -hmm. and he wanted me to be better than him. That's what he always said. You got to be better than the last. So, um, you know, what I mean, so. He allowed me to build relationships. So for me, I started seeing that and it became like me. Someone said this to me last night on my podcast, uh, sampling from everywhere. Mm -hmm. So like while I was struggling to find value in what I was good at, like I was also exposing myself and allowing myself to accept the, the lessons from people that were in my life. My coaches, Coach Powell, Coach Rob. You know what I mean? Teachers that were, I could get something mm -hmm. from um, people in the street. Mm -hmm. Like little things like people that were doing the wrong things, but like learning from little tiny things like loyalty, like like respect. You know what, what do I mean? you think was instilled in you that allowed you to be able to receive that from other people? Openness. I think my mother, my mom being from her, um, her educational background, her thing was always like, be you and be open. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? My mom didn't talk much when we were growing up because it was just like we were in a bad, in a, not a strong, safe neighborhood. So it was like, you got to do good here mm -hmm. and don't mess up mm -hmm. or whatever. And my father would do things and my mom was like, don't be like, don't do that. Don't mm -hmm. do those mistakes. Mm -hmm. Right. But like she was always open to like, you know, like who you like. Don't, you know what I mean? Uh, do what you want to do. You know what I mean? And then like sparking that in us early, kind of like unconsciously became a part of me where I was like, I was doing things that weren't like that, that were different than everybody else. Mm -hmm. I was okay with that. And I look back, I was like, my mom used to say that. That's you know beautiful. I mean? yeah. So it sounds like you had a lot of good teamwork with your parents. Yeah, like, for sure. Uh, so that's very important. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, you, at what point in your life did you determine, okay, yes, this is what it is that I want to do? Oh, that took some time. If you knew me in, in high school or in college when I first started out, I was going to play professionally. Okay. You know what I mean? I put in the hours. I grew up in the neighborhood, in neighborhoods, because I, I did, I grew up in um, Brooklyn partially, and then like around middle school age, I moved out to Long Island. Because, and ironically, I remember the day we moved, like it was in the playground in Brooklyn, um, and I lived right across the street from a, a playground. I remember we was playing, running around. My mm -hmm. head was mad big, so I'm like, <laughs> moving and not paying attention. I see this dude just running full speed. And then three dudes was chasing up a ski mask on. And he just stopped in the middle of the park and they shot him like 10 times in the head. Bang, 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 bang. And I just remember everybody was like, run. I'm like, I'm like 10, 9, 10, 11 around there. Um, and we just run, I'm running to my house. Um, and everybody's like busting out. And I remember a couple days, weeks after quick, we moved. I think it was in the works already, but that was like solidified it, like we gotta go. So um with that, uh huh? Did that like cause some type of traumatic? Experience? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That was like, but you know what I mean, when you're growing up in it, like you don't really know what it is. It's just like this is normal, mm -hmm. right? So like it just becomes like something you talk about to you older mm -hmm. and be like oh that's why i have this issue here because i see this mm -hmm. right so um like 
going through that experience, just knowing like I think my parents wanted to do better and protect us from it, right? Um, going out of that and then I, I'm playing basketball in my neighborhoods, um, everybody was way better than me. Like I was, when I moved to Long Island in Belport, New York, I was playing against dudes that were six fives, could shoot, dunk, whatever, but weren't doing what they had to do in school or didn't have the support mm -hmm. system to get them through school. Like right. they didn't have the, the parent support that I had. Mm -hmm. um, although my father was uh, was doing his thing or whatever and wasn't perfect, I still had two parents at home mm -hmm. regardless, right? So, um, and then to instill that fear of like, you got to do well or whatever. Um, so I, I was around that and I, I remember just getting beat down, getting beat down. Like I, I was trash. And then I had to like, it made me not want to give up. It made me be like, I'm going to still get on the court with them. I'm going to get there two, three hours before they get there. I'm going to practice, and then I'm going to play with them. They'll curse me out. I'll get off the court, but then I'm going to leave. <laughs> I'm going I'm to stay when they leave, and I'm going to keep practicing. Mm -hmm. And that happened until one day um, a coach, Coach Powell, started pack, getting my rebound, passed me the ball. And then he's telling me, do this, mm -hmm. do this, or do this drill. And all of a sudden, I became the protege, right, because I'm working harder than anybody. And then I started doing my thing, and then I ended up breaking records and, and Ended up being the only one from my high school basketball team by a junior to get a scholarship to go to college and play ball. Um, and I played oh, Division two. Yeah, yeah. So um, if you talked to me back then, I was going to play ball. Um, that was my my love, my my mission. But, I mean, sometimes life hits you in a way like, nah, don't go this way, go that way. And you got to be open to that. So me going to college, things didn't work out. And I remember me leaving the basketball team um, after my sophomore year um, at SUNY Corlin. So I played Division One my freshman year, ended up going upstate New York to play Division Three, um, a school that would recruit me a lot sooner. I wanted the whole college experience. First college was too small. Mm -hmm. um, then went up there and things didn't work out um, with uh, athletics. Um, so what I did say was like, you know what? I hated the idea of a job. So I never wanted to be someone that was one dimensional and right. I couldn't be successful without ball. So what I said, I quit the team and I became a resident assistant. Mm -hmm. I became multicultural life in, um, intern, uh, Caribbean Student Association vice president. Um, I became a keynote speaker for the school and I just got super involved. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to make sure everybody remember who I am and I'm not going to be in the ball team. Nice. So I got super involved and I remember I, got, I, I was voluntold to speak at my graduation. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even want to do it. And mm -hmm. I was like, and then I got told, and then I, I practiced it. I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. I practiced, practiced. I, 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 I had told my girlfriend at the time, I said the speech to her the night before, and she was like, ah. So I'm like, man. <laughs> and my parents are going to be there, and everybody's going to be there. So I went up there, and I believe in begin, beginner's luck. And I mm -hmm. remember it like it was yesterday. Same feeling I had when I was going on to the court, playing a big game. My knees weak, arms are heavy. Arms are like, I was like, it was game time and I had the butterflies in my chest, but I learned very early. I used to learn, love that feeling mm. because my preparation will make that feeling go away. Like my, if I'm prepared for uh -huh. it, like that feeling will go after the first couple of jump shots mm. or the, the, the first time you took the ball, right? right? The game starts. So for me, it was that first sentence. And I swear it was like a movie. Like there were babies in the crowd and there were people like, I had people laughing. I had people crying and I had a baby yell out like, yeah, like I was like, oh snap, like I'm good <laughs> at this, funny. right? So, um, and then that was my Kente graduation ceremony. I spoke at that, it went amazing. And then I kept on getting called back after I graduated college to speak at programs and my alumni mm -hmm. and I didn't know the profession until I found the Eric Thomases of the world, Tony Robbins, the mm -hmm. um, Les Browns of the world. And I was like, yo, you can get paid for that. <laughs> so then it became, let me learn how to do this. And then everything that I learned in basketball, right, I just transferred it over and I translated it to it speaking in mm -hmm. my own business. And then I, I became a teacher and I was already in the profession of being around kids. And so I was working on the craft, right, of speaking without knowing it. So like I connected everything. And I just put the work that I was putting on the court, right, to putting the extra hours into, let me let me get better at speaking. Let me go uh, see how it's done. Let me study that. Let me put in the hours to like write a book. Let me put in the hours to like keep going to these events and then put myself out there. You know what I mean? And if I mess up, that's just a bad game. Like, okay, what did I do? Let's go to the tape. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel the vibe of the room. 
I went in thinking like this was going to work and I didn't feel what they needed. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And as a teacher learning that, um, going into spaces like given what is needed. Now, what is wanted, like you on the basketball court, for example, like there's how you become a good player, right? You see what the team already has and then you see what is needed. And then the great ones figure out, okay, we have two scorers. Why am I going to try to score more than everybody else in the court? Mm-hmm. I need to be the facilitator. Right? Or, okay, everybody's scoring, everybody do this, who's getting the rebounds? I'm going to get the rebounds. And those are the ones that become great. So, like, I took that idea to becoming a speaker. Like, so how, how do, do you they need? do that? I guess that's what you were about to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do you um, influence children to, or even adults, to be able to say, okay, you see who is around you and yeah. what their strengths are. How do you encourage that? Because sometimes it's hard to get outside of yourself. So yeah, there are sure. people out there who want who want to have all the strengths and do all the things by themselves. Yeah. How do you influence them to be a team player? I think um, two things. So I think being present in your own experience. Mm-hmm. Right. Some people try to uh, see how other people run things or how other things are ran and try to do it and emulate it. Right. To a certain extent, that's okay. But once you start owning yourself, like stepping into your own truth, you need to understand what is needed for you, mm-hmm. right? And how is that realistic? And you're, how can you like implement that to your life? Like you're sampling here and there, but you need to get to a place where who are What's you? Your uniqueness you know what I mean? Yeah. What What do you bring? Like, right? You can you can hear all these type of things and, and see how people do it, but what are you good at? And how can you like take these pieces? and build it into what you already have that's your strength, right? So having that conversation with yourself alone, and I think people are scared to be alone more than anything, like to have that conversation with yourself and uh, and, and get to know yourself better. We we so hone on like trying to have a relationship young and get mm-hmm. to know somebody on a whole nother level. I had friends. I, was, I used to feel sad about that. I didn't have that many close friends growing up. I had associates, I was popular, but I never had like that. Mm-hmm. Like that, how they used to say, yeah. my ride or die, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I used to get real close to my girlfriends, right? Mm-hmm. And that, for me, it was like I was afraid to just be alone. Mm-hmm. I just wanted people to distract me. And then when I started like seeing that I was doing that, like getting get around people that weren't afraid to be alone mm-hmm. and seeing how it's done, like I was like, oh, okay, I need to really feel like no one should be telling me how I feel. Mm-hmm. I should be able to do that work myself. I should know myself better than anybody else. So pushing people to do that was a mission. Um, and that's what I would tell kids to like figure out and whatever you want to do, you got to know yourself before you go into it. Because if you know yourself, you know what if this is going to work out or not. Is this something you really want? Or this is what you think your parents want or what you think you should be doing, mm-hmm. right? F all of that. You don't. You need to do what you think you, you can do and what you can offer already because you're going to be sad regardless if you're doing it for some other reason. Yeah, so, our guest uh, the other day said the same the same thing. He Johnny said that you need to the first book you need to read is yourself. Yeah, yeah for sure. You're reading all these other things mm-hmm. and you don't even know yourself. Yeah. And I, that's why I've gotten to the point where I used to listen to so many like aspiring people and all that. And now when I do speaking engagements, you I don't listen like, to yourself. I know I don't listen to <laughs> nobody. That's what I'm saying. But I don't listen to nobody because I need to be in tune with what I'm bringing to the table. Because mm-hmm. I don't want to sound like a Gary Vee. I don't want to sound like a Tony Robbins going into an environment that I'm trying to offer my my best self. So like I ex that I got to a point. It's good to like study those greats and all that, mm-hmm. and like how like the Kobe's and the Jordans they they study the greats. But it got to a point once the practice was so uh, done so often, mm-hmm. where it got to a point like okay now. I have so much that I've done that now I can study myself so yeah. that I know what to do better. So I'm competing against myself every time. Like I look I, on my podcast, the Translated Success podcast, I say it all the time. Like hey, this show is better. I, I, at the end of my show, my producer said it. He was like, yo, Carlos always says, uh, this is the best one yet. Mm-hmm. And that's what I want to keep on saying because mm-hmm. every show won't be better than the last one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that, that, that's the mission. That's what I would tell these kids. Beautiful and seen.